every month, we highlight an activity that's related to the webinar topic. This month, we're looking at some distant objects in our solar system. And the activity that a lot of you already have in the Space Rocks Outreach Toolkit that, uh, that came out a few years ago, there's an activity called sorting the solar system. So there's a deck of cards that looks something like this. And inside these deck of cards, there's each deck has two sets. There's actually four sets in total. So each deck has two sets. This one I happen to have the yellow ones. And so there's kind of some games you can play with participants or attendees at your outreach events. One of the most popular is to have, if you have a large group, you could give one of these cards to each of the participants in your, if you have 24 or 20 more, 20 or more people, if each person gets a card, and then based on the information on the card, based on the image that's on the card, and so we have a few terrestrial objects, but they might just be related to some of the objects that are in the solar system. So there's some information on it, and there's an image, and the idea is that they go through and they attempt to organize themselves and classify themselves according to the properties of these objects. Alternatively, if you have a table set up, they can do this on the tabletop and create categories. The really cool thing that we, that, um, we really like people to do is to take the series card out. And so there's a card for series. The one that was in the toolkit has an older uh, image on it, but we've recently updated those and that's on the website. Dave's going to show that in just a minute. And so we take this out and a lot of times what, when I do this with large groups, I like to give this to one person who observes everyone else doing their classifying and then give them this and say, okay, which group would you like to be a member of? Which group should you take series two? And invariably, everyone has sorted themselves and they have to choose between a couple of groups that make a whole lot of sense for them to join. And so it really kind of points out that classifying solar system objects is not nearly as easy as what we are taught in school. It's actually kind of messy. And so hopefully we just might be able to uh, hear a little bit about that here. Um, I think that Dave will put the uh, link for the Outreach Toolkit and this activity from the Night Sky Network website in the chat window. And now for our featured program. Dr. Alan Stern is a planetary scientist, space program executive, aerospace consultant, and author. He leads NASA's New Horizons mission that successfully explored the Pluto system and is now exploring the Kuiper Belt, the farthest exploration in the history of humankind. Dr. David Grinspoon is an astrobiologist, award-winning science communicator, and prize-winning author. His newest book is Chasing New Horizons, Inside the Epic First Mission to Pluto, co-authored with Alan Stern. He's a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute and adjunct professor of astrophysical and planetary science at the University of Colorado. His research focuses on climate evolution of Earth-like planets and potential conditions for life elsewhere in the universe. Please welcome Drs. Alan Stern and David Grinspoon. Hey guys, it's great to see you. <laughs> can you hey, hear me? How's it going? Yep, we can hear you great. Thanks. Excellent. Well, this is really fun. It's like we're all together, even though we're dispersed across the continent. Yeah, we're looking forward to this this evening. Would you like us to start, or do you have some questions? Oh, uh, no, we're ready. We're ready for you to go, and then we'll oh, okay. all come together our, for a Q and A at the end. That was our okay. cue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll jump right in. So, uh, what we're going to do this evening uh, is I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory, what went into uh, the exploration of Pluto. I'm going to put up some PowerPoint and sort of walk you through. Uh, a little one-on-one -on, -one on the mission, but then Dave's going to really tell you about the book and the plot line in the book and what it consists of, and then we're going to answer questions. So we'll jump right in. I'm going to share my screen. There we are. And then uh, I will launch the slides. Uh, move the camera out of the way. There we go. Okay, so uh, the title of my talk uh, this evening is, uh, is about chasing new horizons. It's to explore Pluto. 
And there you see uh, that wonderful open door to what we imagined Pluto might look like before we did the flyby in 2015. And we just completely underestimated uh, that planet and its system of moons. They have blown us away. And so uh, let me jump right in and show you uh, how much New Horizons changed the game because this is the best picture image of Pluto ever made before New Horizons. And it's just a fuzzy blob. Now, this was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is as good a tool as we have, but because Pluto's only about the, the width of North America, and it's three billion miles away, this is the best we could do with modern technology from such a large distance. And really, it's because of those large distances that we have to send spacecraft out to these planets to explore them in detail. You know, take a look at a picture of the Earth like this. Now, with this kind of imagery, you can really do science. You can uh, tell that the Earth has continents and oceans, and complex weather, uh, a polar cap down there in the south in Antarctica. And in fact, by carefully analyzing this image, just this one image at this kind of resolution, you can learn a lot about our home planet and its atmosphere and a little bit even about its internal engine and its geology. But if you smear, if you repixelate this image of the Earth, to the best resolution of that Pluto image, the best we had before New Horizons, that's all you get. That is a faithfully repixelated version of the image of the Earth that you just saw. And from this, what could you tell about the Earth? Very, very little. Uh, and uh, I think we can drive that ho point home a little bit further. Um, you might uh, think to yourself, what are we looking at here? And uh, no telling what you're guessing, but I bet you're not guessing what you're really looking at. Because at that resolution, you really can't tell one type of object from another, as illustrated by uh, that pixelated version of the flag and the full resolution version. So uh, we go to the planets to explore them. We have to see them up close in order to do that. Uh, at the conclusion of the Voyager project, that explored all the giant planets in the 1980s. Uh, a group of us as young scientists wanted to see NASA go on and cover a little bit of unfinished business and explore Pluto, which Voyager unfortunately couldn't explore. And listed there on this slide are a whole series of attempts to get a mission to Pluto that stretched all the way across the 90s. And uh, as we describe in our book, Chasing New Horizons, uh, there was a lot of complicated politics involved, uh, a lot of intrigue. And uh, it, it took a long time to make the case to raise the kind of money that it takes. Uh, we had to overcome some management challenges, some mismanagement challenges. Uh, there were really no technical barriers. It just took a long time. It was 2001 before New Horizons came on the scene and actually became a mission that got off the drawing board and actually got built. And a big part of that was convincing the planetary science community that going to Pluto was one of the most important things we could do with our limited budgets because we all have to share those budgets and there are many competing desires scientifically to study small bodies like comets and asteroids, to go back to the giant planets and their fascinating systems of moons, uh, to, to go back to our own moon, to study Mars in more depth and they're all jostling and competing for priority and only the very top most highly ranked science can be afforded because there are many times more ideas than there's money to go around for all those ideas. And the winnowing is very steep. It's not just the top 10%, it's more like the top 5% that actually get funded. So if you wonder uh, what it was that uh, got Pluto funded, let me tell you what almost got us there. And it was what we learned about Pluto from the Earth, fascinating Pluto, and uh, uh, that system from telescopes back on the Earth. And even though our imagery, even using the Hubble, was blurry, uh, that top graph is a reflectance spectrum of the surface of Pluto made in the early 90s that showed us just how complicated uh, Pluto's uh, surface is. It's dominated by molecular nitrogen ices, but there are also dips in those spectra due to methane, which is basically fuel that's scattered all around the surface, and carbon monoxide, a third ice, and at Pluto's temperatures, all three of those ices are mobile. That's a 
complicated situation that's uh, really outdoes not only the Earth, but even Mars in its, in its complexity. The other figures here show some other aspects of what we were learning in the late 80s and the 90s about Pluto. On the bottom left is a graph from what's called a stellar occultation that showed us that Pluto has an atmosphere and one with complicated vertical structure. And uh, of course that excited the atmospheric scientists. When we discovered Pluto's large moon Charon and understood that it was half the size and almost a tenth the mass of Pluto, it became clear that the origin mechanism for the pluto sharon binary planet, as we call it, um, is very similar to the giant impact that formed the Earth-Moon system. In fact, it's ironic, but nowhere else in the solar system, from the Earth all the way out to where Pluto is, nowhere in between did we find another example to study by analogy how the Earth-Moon system was formed. But we knew that at Pluto we could, um, we could do that because it's such a similar formation mechanism. And then on the right, is a cutaway drawing of what we came to understand in the 90s, the composition of Pluto. You know, we found all these ices on its surface, and we expected an icy planet through and through, but when we understood its mass and its size and could get its density, it became clear that you can't judge that book by its cover. Pluto is ice covered on the outside, but inside it's about 70% rock by mass. So it's really a rocky planet with an icy shell, and that was highly surprising, not expected for something in the deep outer solar system. And all these attributes from Pluto's giant satellite to its atmosphere, to its interior, its complicated surface composition, all those were strongly indicating this was a place that was gonna be a worthwhile exploration target. But what really made the difference was a change in our view of the map of our solar system, the architecture, if you will. This is the old view. It's probably something you saw like I did in grade school textbooks. It's kind of a map, a 20th century era map of the solar system. It shows the sun in the middle, the four rocky planets orbiting in those tight orbits down by the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, a little asteroid belt, and then on a much expanded scale, the orbits of the four gargantuan giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in order, that weigh tens to hundreds of times what uh, the Earth, the largest of the terrestrial planets, weighs. And then orbiting beyond both that inner zone with the rocky planets where the Earth orbits and the realm of the giant planets was Pluto, which when it was discovered in 1930, immediately stood out as not fitting either pattern. Didn't look like a giant planet, didn't look like a terrestrial planet, uh, orbited much further out, much more egg-shaped orbit, uh, that really left our 20th century view as Pluto's the misfit of the solar system. But as it turned out, eventually as technology got better, the telescopes, the CCD detectors, the computer technology to detect faint moving targets, we eventually found that that view was completely myopic, that the real view of the solar system um, is more like what we're going to show right now and I have to start a little video. We're looking down on the solar system, and there you see dots appearing out there where Pluto, the big dot, is orbiting. These are actual discoveries of other objects that orbit with Pluto. They're much smaller than Pluto generally, but every now and then you'll see a big dot. This is the Kuiper Belt. It's the third zone of our solar system, and it's the biggest discovery about the architecture of our solar system in any of our lifetimes. It revolutionized what we know. And I want to stop the video and say that it wasn't just that the discovery of the Kuiper Belt provided context for Pluto and redrew the map of the solar system. The most interesting thing was we found the Kuiper Belt is littered with small planets, of which Pluto turns out to be the largest uh, and the brightest and the one that we knew the most about. But there are plenty more, and you see some of their names, like Sedna and Haumea and Makimake and Iris and Ixion and Varuna and so forth. And it was this discovery that really rocketed the priority to go out and explore Pluto up to the very top of the list, because we realized, and all the way up to the National Academy of Sciences, that there was this third zone to the solar system with a third class of planets, the so-called dwarf planets, that had never been explored. and Pluto 
represented the archetype uh, of that whole class. And so by going to Pluto, we could begin the exploration of this new class of planets and this new region of the solar system. And uh, in fact, just to put that in perspective, up here along the top are all the planets of the solar system from Jupiter through the four giant planets to Earth and Venus, all ordered in size, all the way down to the tiniest guys. And you know, Pluto, which we had thought had been to be the smallest planet, actually turns out to be right here where I'm pointing, the middle of the distribution. Just amazing. Who knew the solar system was so good at making planets? And that did cause the National Academy of Sciences uh, in the early 2000s in prioritizing missions in a process we call the Decadal Survey to rank the exploration of Pluto in the Kuiper Belt number one on the runway for priority. And that unleashed the funding. And as we tell the story in Chasing New Horizons, uh, NASA put on a competition and let teams form uh, to propose their own mission. Uh, I led the New Horizons team, of course, and this is the cover of our proposal here in the lower right. That proposal is about, well, even thicker than that, about the thickness of a, a, an old New York City phone book with technical designs and uh, scientific case, and scientific instrument designs, plans for how we would carry out the entire project. And other teams formed and wrote their own proposals. And then NASA had those proposals reviewed and competed and ultimately selected New Horizons as, as the best. And uh, off we went to the races. Um, that was in late 2001 that we were selected. And for the next four years, as New Horizons built up to eventually be a team of over 2,500 men and women, um, we were in a real horse race uh, to build an outer planet spacecraft in about half the time it had ever been done before because we had to make the one and only remaining Jupiter gravity assist launch window of the 2000s, so a launch window that lasted only three weeks long in January of 2006. And so this team was working nights, was working weekends, year after year to design and build and then test that spacecraft, um, racing really against the odds uh, to make that launch window. And at the same time, we were very heavily challenged by the fact that the budget that we accepted from NASA to do this was only about 20% the size of the Voyager budget. So we had to make some pretty big innovations, some pretty dramatic breakthroughs in how you do low cost outer planet exploration. But my institution, the Southwest Research Institute and our partners at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, universities around the country, Ball Aerospace and others um, signed up for that and we actually pulled it off. And this is the spacecraft that we built. That's New Horizons down in Florida, uh, shortly before its launch at the Cape. You can see the dish antenna on top. Uh, my cursor is pointing to the nuclear power battery, their so-called radioisotope thermoelectric generator that powers all the spacecraft that go far from the sun where sunlight uh, uh, isn't strong enough. You can see how small this spacecraft is next to these people. You know, Voyager is the size of a, a houseboat by comparison. And inside this little shell here are all the guidance systems, command and control, the communication systems, the propulsion system, everything we need for the journey. And in, in our book, we describe the whole design process as a great for nerds chapter about how we made those innovations to save money and uh, to, to, to invent things like how we hibernate a spacecraft as it flies across the solar system so we could have much smaller flight control teams. We also talk about the giant advances in scientific instrumentation, the quantum leaps in our ability to send much smaller cameras with much higher capability, and the same for spectrometers and other instruments on board. And, uh, and we did make that launch window, and we finally got uh, to our ride, this giant skyscraper-sized Atlas V that was uh, customized, completely tricked out to make this the fastest spacecraft ever launched so that we could cross the solar system in record time. Uh, we met the launch vehicle uh, down in Florida in late 2005 with our spacecraft ready to go. And uh, right at the end, just a few days before launch, uh, we fueled that nuclear power generator that I'm pointing at with its radioactive plutonium. 
sealed the cap. And uh, because it was radioactive, they wanted to put the hatch, of course, on the, on the nose cone. And uh, uh, they gave us a chance to have a few of us on the project have our picture taken. And uh, as I tell in the book, this is, uh, was my choice to go last in that list because I knew that that would be the last picture ever taken of New Horizons. Just minutes after this picture was taken, that hatch was closed. There in the nose cone, uh, New Horizons sat in the darkness until we launched it six days later on the 19th of January, 2006. And that launch was just incredible. Um, that big rocket, 225 feet tall, went supersonic in half a minute, uh, put us in Earth orbit in eight minutes. And uh, actually in under an hour, New Horizons was off the launch vehicle, traveling so fast that it crossed the orbit of the moon in only nine hours. Compare that to Apollo missions. It took three days. And uh, we were off and on our way. And there was some drama around the launch. Um, there were uh, two launch attempts that, um, uh, that uh, didn't succeed before we had the one that did succeed. We tell that whole story too. And then uh, we tell the story of our journey across the solar system, first to Jupiter uh, for that gravity assist and uh, for the only thing that we pass along the way. So our only flight test to make sure that things would work at Pluto and then off across a long eight year journey from early 2007 until July of 2015 towards that, that ring of material called the Kuiper Belt where Pluto is to intercept Pluto's orbit right as it crossed the plane of the solar system uh, with our red trajectory of our spacecraft coming out. You know, during those eight years, um, our team was extremely busy and only 50 of us or so whereas Voyager had 450 people to do a similar job. And uh, there's a wonderful chapter called Battle Plan Pluto, where we really tell the inside story of how you plan a one-shot flyby and make your backup plans and how you guarantee that you can dodge hazards if you dis discover them at the last minute, how you train your team, how you prepare for every aspect of what we call showtime. Uh, our, our encounter with Jupiter was completely successful. These are images of Jupiter and its volcanic moon Io made by New Horizons as we pass by. And then uh, we were off on that long journey I just spoke about. But I'll fast forward here in the interest of time and turn to the flyby, which began when we woke the spacecraft up from hibernation in December of 2014 and began in earnest once we prepared the spacecraft uh, with navigation and hazard avoidance imagery in early 2015, heading for that culmination in the summer on the Bastille Day on the 14th of July, 2015, when New Horizons swept down inside the orbits of all of Pluto's moons, um, down very close to Pluto, and uh, used its cameras and onboard spectrometers to study Pluto's surface, its geology, all five of its moons, to, uh, to map its surface composition, to assay its atmospheric pressure and temperature and atmospheric composition. And uh, boy, the result was just fabulous. Uh, these are pictures of a couple of people that are in the book. Glenn Fountain on the left, who's our was our project manager during the uh, spacecraft build and during the flight across the solar system. And there's a view with one of our flight controllers in our homebrew mission control at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Uh, and then uh, we found ourselves on close approach to Pluto, to the only new planet explored since the Voyager days, a generation before. And uh, this is kind of a family portrait with Pluto in the lower right, its giant Texas-sized moon, Charon, um, there just above and to the left, and two of its four small moons, Nix and Hydra, shown here. This, this image was made when we were literally still millions of miles away. Uh, but we did much better became, because we came so much closer. Uh, this is a nice montage of uh, global mosaics of Pluto and its big moon. And you can see how different the two objects are. They've evolved completely differently. Pluto's bright and colorful with an atmosphere and a very highly varied surface geology. Charon is uh, a lot like the icy satellites of the giant planets, covered in water ice and uh, very ancient surface. Here's Charon up close. And you can see how heavily battered that surface is. And from those crater counts, we can age date that surface at four billion years old. Uh, but we also see really interesting features on top of those craters imprinted on top, like the red polar cap that uh, is unlike anything seen anywhere else in the solar system. And that giant 
scar across the equator that I'm pointing out with the cursor, which is what the geologists call the equatorial tectonic belt. But what it really is is, is uh, the result of the freezing of all the water inside of Sharon. And as the water froze, it expanded, of course, and uh, created stress patterns that ultimately created this canyon system that dwarfs the Grand Canyon, 1,500 kilometers long, uh, 10 times as deep as the Grand Canyon, the largest canyon system seen anywhere in the outer solar system. Well, that's Sharon, but I'll tell you, it doesn't compare next to Pluto, because Pluto turned out to be far beyond our our wildest dreams in terms of its complexity and geologic activity. I think if you look in the upper right, you see that iconic image of Pluto with the heart on its surface. That heart is a giant nitrogen glacier that's uh, larger than the states of Texas and Oklahoma combined. And here you see it in the main image in close-up, where we've wrapped those images on a sphere so it gives you the appearance that you're actually standing above planet Pluto and looking down. And you can see that those crater, uh, fields um, in the periphery of the image, the older terrains, don't look anything like the glacier. The glacier doesn't have any craters on it whatsoever. Even in our highest resolution images, we can't find any craters, meaning that that surface was born yesterday geologically. And that really shook up uh, uh, planetary science. To think that a small planet the size of Pluto could be so active as to create a million square kilometers of glacial terrain so recently that not a single crater appears was just jaw-dropping. But there was a lot more that we found. We found that that glacier is actually flowing. We found currents in the glacier, particularly where it abuts the mountains. And we found evidence of avalanches from the mountains above here that you see the yellow and uh, pinkish and green terrains that are at high altitude, more than 20,000 feet above the glacier, where material is poured out in avalanches down these chutes into the glacier. And we found that Pluto's atmosphere is fascinating with these concentric haze layers and that the surface is much more rugged than uh, many expected because the water ice that makes up Pluto's crust is a strong enough material to support towering mountains. And not just mountains, but mountains with snow caps like these. These mountains are the size of uh, the Rockies in Colorado where I live. And the snow caps look very similar to the snow caps out my window in Colorado. They're bright and white and cresting the top of all those mountains, but they're not made of water ice. Those snow caps were fingerprinted spectroscopically by New Horizons, and they're created by methane, a light hydrocarbon, a fuel that we use in kitchens all around the Earth. It literally snows fuel on Pluto. And uh, that's one of the reasons I like to call it a sci-fi planet. But there was more. We found uh, evidence for ice volcanoes, like this one that we call Wright Mons, which is the size of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, just as tall and just as wide. It's a massive structure, and it, by the way, also doesn't have any craters on its flanks, meaning it must be very young as well. That Pluto's active in many different ways. In fact, it even has what we believe are frozen lakes on its surface, like this one, which we know from stereo imaging is in a hanging valley. And you can see the shoreline around this lake, which is about 20 miles uh, stem to stern uh, and made of nitrogen again. But the interesting thing about this is you can't have liquids on Pluto's surface today. The pressure in the atmosphere is too low and the temperature is too low. You can only have ices. So the presence of this feature is a strong clue like others, that Pluto used to have liquid standing or running on its surface. And even beyond the volcanoes and the glaciers and the avalanches and the atmosphere and the frozen lakes, we found strong evidence that Pluto has a global liquid water ocean in its interior, something that has really turned heads uh, because it could mean that Pluto, like Europa and other worlds with oceans on the interior, uh, could be an abode for life. And it raises the priority for doing things like going back to Pluto with an orbiter to study it in more detail and learn more about that ocean. Well, uh, I'm going to close by saying this is our favorite, my favorite image of the entire flyby. It's true color looking back as we pass through Pluto's shadow, looking back at the planet silhouetting, being 
uh, silhouetting the sun, which is backlighting the atmosphere. And as we tell in Chasing New Horizons, the story of the 26 years between when a group of young scientists with a dream uh, started to figure out how you could convince NASA and the scientific community that we should go back deep to the frontier of our solar system and explore the Pluto system and how that came to be uh, and all the trials and tribulations and competitions and setbacks and victories and uh, the flight across the solar system and the exploration of Pluto, all of that 26 years for me is culminated in this single image because I worked 26 years like a lot of us did to have a picture taken from the far side of Pluto and this is it. And I think it's a beautiful image and I think it, uh, it nicely encapsulates the accomplishment of what we did. And I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave to talk about uh, Chasing New Horizons and uh, the human story. All right. Um, let's see, can you guys hear me? Um, I, I am unmuted. Um, good evening. Well, uh, that was awesome, Alan. That, that's a real uh, encapsulation of, of a lot of what, it, what is in the book. Um, but, but let me uh, talk a little bit more about the experience of writing the book and, and, and about how, uh, how, how the book came together and how it's structured and, and, and what's in it. Um, for me, the, uh, the story that Alan just summarized uh, nicely of, uh, of New Horizons is uh, really one of the most incredible exploration stories of our time. And um, so the experience of, uh, of being able to write Chasing New Horizons um, with Alan uh, was really just um, a, such a privilege for me. It's, it's a story that I've treasured for a long time, um, that I've known about, I've followed, uh, I've been uh, somewhat involved myself in terms of serving on committees that at times were pivotal, but mostly I was involved as just a member of the planetary science community and as a fan of this mission. Um, and, and so I, I, I've watched this unfold really over decades. And uh, so many times I remember thinking that I cannot believe um, what these guys are going through. I cannot believe this story. If you know, someday that somebody, someday somebody's going to write a book about this, uh, a good book, you know, especially if they succeed, which, you know, <laughs> at times when I thought that it seemed like a long shot, you know, uh, but so now to remember feeling that way, but to have actually seen the mission through and seen it succeed and then have to have had the opportunity to write the story of this mission with Alan Stern, who lived it, um, has really been a privilege. And um, when Alan approached me about working on this book together, I was like, are you kidding? Uh, you know, of course, <laughs> yes, let's do this. Because, uh, uh, because, I, I, because I know it's a great story. At the same time, I knew it was gonna be a big challenge to, um, to encapsulate all this in, you know, in a book that's only um, you know, uh, 269 pages, <laughs> because uh, there's so much to tell. And in fact, when we originally wrote this book, there was a lot more and we had to winnow it down. And you know, what's left is like the really good stuff. But uh, basically, this came about through a long series of conversations. Um, Alan and I um, started off by really, once we agreed to work on this book together uh, and, and you know, came up with a very rough outline, which of course evolves as you're working on it, what we did was we spoke every Saturday for like a year and a half on the phone. And it started off, Alan had a series of stories, a list of stories that he wanted to tell me. And then that, of course, in the telling and in the questions I asked him led to more stories. And we went through them and, and, and um, then figured out how they would all fit into the structure of, of telling the story of New Horizons. And in the process also of telling me these stories, a lot of other characters came out. And he would mention somebody and I'd be like, I got to follow up on that. And that led to a list of a whole lot of other participants that I interviewed, uh, scientists, engineers, people at NASA who are involved in the political drama. Um, and one thing that was fun was hearing the same story from multiple people. Uh, and then, you know, trying to synthesize um, the, the 
uh, the events and, and pulling in multiple voices. And you'll see many places in, in Chasing New Horizons where that we, we cut away from the narrative to just let people talk in their own voices. So there are places where you hear Alan's voice in the first person, but then also people like Alice Bowman, the mission operations manager, who was absolutely key and is you know a hero of the mission and some of the other scientists. And, and you'll hear uh, the stories narrated in their voices about what the experience was like. And, and, you know, roughly it comes down to sort of three, sto three Uber stories, which then are all told through the personal experience of the people who, who experience it. And those three stories are, um, number one is the, sort of the politics, the behind the scenes, how it works, how a mission really happens, how it goes from this dream, as Alan said, a bunch of young dreamers uh, who didn't fully know how to make this happen, but, you know, first sat in a room together and plotted, you know, we want to send a mission to Pluto. How are we going to make this happen? And, and, and formulated a plan. And then all the struggles they went through, um, you know, ridiculous struggles for years of dead ends and doors slammed in their faces and having to, you know, go to plan B and plan C and <laughs> plan D prime. But, you know, eventually, uh, you know, not giving up and um, making it happen. But then wound through that, the science comes out because the science weaves into the politics in a lot of ways. As Alan described, a lot of discoveries happened uh, during this struggle that made the case for Pluto more compelling. So one of the objections at first was, well, Pluto's not that interesting. It's just an, an oddball on the, on the outer edge of the solar system. Why would you want to send a mission there? It's so far away and would cost so much. But as this effort was under, was underway to try to make the mission happen, several discoveries happened, which made it more compelling. The discovery of, of, of Pluto's moon Charon, the discovery of the methane on the surface of Pluto, the, the discovery of the Kuiper belt, most important of all, as Alan mentioned, that, that it's this whole zone of the solar system. So the story got more and more interesting as they marshaled support, and that really became key in getting the scientific community, the planetary science community, ultimately to line up behind this mission. So there's that whole story of marshalling the support and just getting approval and getting funded and getting green lit and the drama that goes into that. And then once they have a mission, they have to do the mission. And it, you know that's really intense because there's a ticking clock. They have to meet the launch window. They have to meet the budget. And so then there's all the how the sausage is made of, of how does a mission really come together? Uh, what are the decisions and how do the teams organize and who does what and how the heck do you make this all happen within this uh, very tight time budget? Um, and I think we tell that story in a way that's never been told before. So anybody that's interested in space exploration who wants to know how a mission really comes together, I think there's a lot for you in this book. And then, of course, finally, there's the drama of the launch and the trip across the whole solar system, which... Um, you know, is, again, there's a lot of untold stories there. Uh, you know, some people think, well, once you launch, you just, you're just waiting for nine years and, you know, aren't you bored? But, <laughs> you know, no, there's, it's very intense, the, the work that goes in and, the, and, you know, the different phases, getting to Jupiter, testing out the spacecraft at Jupiter, uh, uh, the data that you get from that flyby, but mostly, you're, you know, it's a trial run for the spacecraft. And then even the, the long ride to um, Pluto, there's a lot of really intense, you know, just the planning that's going on. The, um, um, whoa, is something happening on my screen here? No, we're okay, I'm still there. I just got a glitch there for a second. The, the, um, the amount of just precision planning, the choreography of the spacecraft that has to be constructed and has to work flawlessly the first time. And then of course, there's a couple of hairy moments when things do not go as planned. And there's, uh, there's especially one major glitch that happens at the worst possible moment where the spacecraft goes offline. There's a huge crisis. We're, they're almost at Pluto. Um, the team is tested as never before. Alice Bowman, who I, met, who I mentioned before, the mission operations manager, she and her team of engineers um, save the day in, um, you know, it, literally it's a cliffhanger and just at the last possible moment they get the spacecraft back online. And if it hadn't happened, you know, within a space of a few hours, literally, uh, the, the flyby would have been lost. And so that's, you know, 
more intense drama than you know <laughs> than anybody would wish, <laughs> but it makes a good story. Uh, and uh, you know, and then and then the flyby itself, the the encounter of Pluto. Uh, of course, we tell the technical story and the scientific story, but the emotional story, the experience of the participants, people in their own words telling what it was like to be there, the surreal sense of this moment you've lived for, you know, your whole life, your whole career, unfolding so quickly um, and uh, so dramatically and so powerfully. And then, and then the payoff, of course, the images, Alan showed you a few of them. In the book, we've got a selection of really high quality, nicely reproduced images of Pluto and the moons and of the spacecraft and, and candid shots of the team members and the people that we tell you about. So that's all there. And then, you know, the payoff, it, the scientific payoff and the, um, the conceptual payoff of sort of rewriting what we know about how planets work, about how our solar system is constructed, about the, um, the potential for small planets to exhibit this, you know, just incredible diversity and lively behavior, uh, you know, is something that we're going to be uh, incorporating into the way we think about uh, planets for a long time, you know. Um, so, so that was, you know, there were a lot of great surprises. And, you know, finally, we end on talking about um, the public response and, and you know, what, what we describe is in a way the, the, um, the thing that surprised us the most or the thing, the, the thing that we learned that maybe we weren't expecting, uh, we end by talking about just the way that this, uh, that the new knowledge and the exploration of Pluto inspired people. And the effect that it had on people it was so, um, you know, so moving, you know, that, that people um, telling Alan stories and even during our book tour that we just did, people telling us uh, stories from around the world of um, their experience of the Pluto flyby, you know, and it really was this global event now that we're all connected as, as we can see now, because we're all talking to each other from different parts of the, the country in real time. But people were telling us stories from, you know, we met this guy who was in a bunker in Kabul um, during the, uh, the flyby, hit and refresh to see the new pictures. And, you know, just the, the outpouring of global interest and inspiration um, at a time when we all need it, let's face it. <laughs> you know, that, that, that inspiration, that sense of uh, that our country can do great things uh, and that the human race can do great things and that the exploration of new places is, is not over. Uh, you know, that, that sort of, um, there's a feel good aspect to this story um, that is, is genuine and that uh, people are really responding to. So, um, you know, I, I feel really good about uh, that, that, that we were able to take all of that. Um, and, you know, our initial manuscript, of course, was much longer than our final manuscript because there really is a lot there and winnow it down to a really, um, I think, crisp and, um, and compelling story that people are telling us that they're, they're finding really inspiring. Uh, and, you know, people keep telling us this ought to be a movie. And uh, we're like, you know, well, OK, you know, who's going to play Alan? But <laughs> but I mean, the, the point is that there it, there's genuine uh, drama and um, genuine. It's, it's kind of a thriller. You know, of course, there's science, but it's not ultimately uh, a book about, you know, it's certainly not a textbook. It's a book about the human drama and what it takes to um, to uh, fixate on on an idea, um, not let go and ultimately explore in, uh, you know, go places and go farther than anyone's ever gone before. And, you know, really what is behind that in terms of the human effort and the technical ingenuity and, um, you know, that, that, that's the story we tell um, and, and the way it affected people. And um, I, I feel pretty good about the fact that we, uh, I think we pulled it off. So anyways, that's Chasing New Horizons. I, I, I could keep going, but I won't because we want to um, now take some questions, I think. And we certainly have a lot of questions that have uh, come in. And so uh, it's, and I, I really like what you said there, David. Um, I know a lot of times when I'm working with teachers and doing these so uh, solar system classification activities and, and we think about the demotion of Pluto and we talk about whether that was an emotional or a rational uh, reaction that they're having to that, and invariably they all say, "Oh yeah, it's an emotional reaction that it, it you know might you know upset us or whatever with uh, with the whole process." And 
we have this emotional attachment to Pluto for some reason and that we don't have for other planets, you know, sometimes maybe not even for our own planet. So it's interesting. So. Yeah. By the way, one, one part of the uh, story that I forgot to mention just now uh, that's relevant to that is that we do tell the story of Clyde Tombaugh and his discovery of Pluto. And the fact that this is all, you know, that from, that it wasn't that long ago, 1930, there were people still alive and that this whole, sort of generational arc from the discovery of Pluto and the beginning of planetary exploration and um, the, you know, the attachment that people have to Pluto, um, as you mentioned, is really remarkable. And that's something we keep discovering again and again. And I, you know, I, I, to some degree, I understand it. It's an underdog, it's an outlier, it's an oddball, you know, um, people maybe identify with that, but there's also, there's some mysterious, um, I still don't understand it, but kids love Pluto and people love Pluto. It's for some reason, it's the planet that people love. Yeah. You know, if I could just jump in for a minute, the, the whole story of uh, uh, how we view and mi many, maybe the vast majority of planetary scientists view that whole IAU decision is about 1% of the book. We wrote three or four pages about that because you have to cover it. But uh, the brilliance of the book is really the architecture of the story that David put together. And he's such a fine writer and he's done so many award-winning books. And, you know, you could have written just the story in order, but he actually starts in 2015 with the spacecraft on approach and having this near-death experience he talked about. And then, uh, you know, even though maybe the cover is a spoiler, you know, you know, we got the Pluto, um, he leaves you hanging. Uh, just a dozen pages into the book, you, there's this crisis and it develops and it's horrific in its proportions. The spacecraft is hurtling towards Pluto with no instructions for how to carry out the flyby, and the minutes are ticking away. And then David takes you back to the start and works through all the politics and all the challenges and a flight across the solar system before you find out how it turned out. And it's just brilliantly written. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, you know, uh, uh, like David said, it ought to be a movie. You know, you wrote a novel. Um, except it really happened. You know, it was a Michael Crichton novel that really happened. And uh, that's David's uh, David's uh, skill set showing off right there. I think I can see uh, Tom Hanks playing you, Alan. So it's... Uh... <laughs> okay, we've got a few Tom questions. Tom goes on a journey. It doesn't work out well. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> true. That's true. <laughs> Constantly on spacecraft that blow up or airplanes yeah. that crash, whatever. Oh, that's true. That's true. Uh, well, we've got a few questions here, and, and uh, I'm going to try to, we, we, I'm going to have to jump back and forth a little bit to try to combine some. So Mark asked, that I, I have a, a I want to add on to the, from someone else earlier, asked, how far is the vessel expected to travel before it no longer receives signals or has no further energy to accomplish those tests? And very early on, Kurtz asked about the redirect in terms of the fuel and so, and then instruments on board to study interstellar stellar space, yeah. the prolonged mission, you know, how are you, how are you doing that as far as fuel and instrumentation? Well, you know, uh, from the beginning, when NASA called for this mission, they required all the teams that competed to design a spacecraft that could go way beyond Pluto, could communicate much further out, it could last much longer, and it could go on exploring across the Kuiper Belt. And that's what we're doing right now. I don't know if you can see the mission sticker for our first extended mission, which is uh, uh, now reaching its high point because in six months, we're at the end of June, at the end of December, we're gonna explore another object a billion miles. That's easy to say, but hard to fathom. A billion miles further than Pluto, uh, one of the building blocks of these small planets like Pluto, which we've nicknamed Ultima Thule. And uh, uh, we're, we're real excited because we are right on approach for that, final approach for that now. But the spacecraft has the power uh, on board from its nuclear battery to go on for decades. It should operate into the 2030s before the power levels drop to where we can't really operate it. And across that next 15 or 20 years, spacecraft will travel to a distance about three times as far away as Pluto, almost a hundred times as far from the sun as the earth is. And we're, we expect to look for more flyby targets we expect to study dozens of Kuiper Belt objects and the environment out there. And the spacecraft is completely healthy. None of the backup systems are being used. And we expect to, to be out exploring the Kuiper Belt for a long time. 
Okay, Stuart has an interesting question back to uh, Pluto itself. Any thoughts on the idea that what appears as geological activity might be Pluto responding to the variation in solar heating it receives um, due to its uh, you know, highly elliptical orbit? Well, that's a clever idea, but the arithmetic doesn't work out. Pluto is very far from the sun, even at its closest approach to the sun, each orbit, the sunlight is only one one thousandth as powerful as it is here on the earth. So it's very feeble. And yeah, it goes almost twice that far out. So now it's down another factor of four times less, but you know, it's like feeble and ultra feeble. And the difference is so small in terms of the numbers that it can't, it can't even power uh, the atmosphere, barely power the atmosphere. It's not about to be enough energy budget to power geology that can lift mountain ranges or create avalanches and, you know, vast volcanoes. So uh, it's a clever idea, but it just doesn't work by the numbers. There must be something going on in the interior of Pluto that creates this, this very active geology that rivals the Earth and Mars. And we don't, un I'll admit it, we don't understand it. People have a lot of ideas. We don't know if any of them are right. I mean, it, it must be, it, it's certainly true that that some of those long-term cycles of climate and season on Pluto add to the complexity and the interest of what's going on on the surface. You know, the interesting frosting on the cake, for sure, but the cake itself, I mean, you don't make uh, 14,000 foot mountains by, you know, by interesting weather. There's something going on in the interior that's doing that geology. And uh, this kind of, uh, there might be a follow-up here. Mark asks, or maybe you already answered this. Mark asks, do any other KBOs have atmospheres? And then he also asked about possible energy sources for generating those and any new surface features. Well, there are objects, uh, you know, other planets in the Kuiper Belt that have the same volatiles on their surface, the nitrogen, for example, and the methane, uh, and even the carbon monoxide are seen on the surfaces of other small planets out there. But so far, we haven't detected an atmosphere anywhere but at Pluto. And, uh, you know, I hope to see in my lifetime uh, missions to go exploring some of those other worlds that are out there and where we can really get up close. And I showed why we need to get up close because we can't study them very well from afar. We might find that they have atmospheres now or atmospheres in the past. Currently, Pluto is the only one with an atmosphere. And uh, interestingly enough, an atmosphere with blue skies. <laughs> See, so Lloyd asks a, a question, and uh, I know a couple of years ago, uh, Mike Brown announced a possible other planet out there. Is there any instrumentation on New Horizons to potentially look for evidence of this additional large planet? It, it would be great if there were. Um, the telescopes on New Horizons are pretty small. The largest one is about this diameter, and you can do better from the Earth, not only because we have vastly larger telescopes, uh, but also because our data transmission rates are pretty low and the amount of data that you have to take uh, to search the entire sky to maybe find uh, more distant planets uh, is something you, we really can't do from New Horizons. It's better to do it from big ground-based observatories. So Brian asked, uh, based on what we've learned from New Horizons, are there any new questions that have come up that would justify another mission to the Kuiper Belt? Or maybe we can even extend that and say what real, well, there are lots of surprises, but what new questions are you most interested in investigating? Well, we're both scientists, so we ought to both take a crack at that one. You want to go first, Dave? Well, yeah. I mean, in general, I would say that New Horizons has vastly raised the scientific profile of the Kuiper Belt as a, um, as a set of targets for future missions. Um, because, um, you know, I mean, there was a wide, wide spectrum of how interesting Pluto could have been. And, you know, at a scale of, of one to 10, it's, you know, it's like 275 as far as how interesting it is. It's just way off the scale. And, um, you know, so the, the real, I mean, the, to me, the burning question is, do you send the next mission back to Pluto or do you go elsewhere in the Kuiper Belt? But it's like, you know, the Kuiper Belt itself is is such a rich place uh, that we know now that, you know, that a small planet can be as active and as interesting, uh, a small planet that far from the sun uh, 
New Horizons has raised so many more questions than it's answered now. I mean, I just want, I want to see what's on the other side of Pluto, you know, for one thing. And those, and, and you want to do long-term investigations and deeper investigations and, and, and follow up on, you know, is there really an ocean and, and what are its characteristics? That's just on Pluto alone. And then, yeah, there are all these other interesting objects out there. So, so absolutely, we're going to uh, need new missions. And I think the case for that is going to be much easier to make now than it would have been, uh, you know, a few years ago. And I have no doubt that there'll be more missions to the Kuiper Belt. We're coming up on a new decadal survey, and New Horizons showed how, how scientifically game-changing uh, Pluto is. Uh, it deserves an orbiter. We really want to understand that ocean, the geology, as Dave said, map the rest of the planet, get up close to the moons that we couldn't do. Uh, there's so much to learn at Pluto uh, that uh, uh, there's no question. It's just too hard to figure out with one mission on a simple flyby. But on the other side of the equation is the fact that when we look at the planets of the Kuiper Belt, uh, we see they're as diverse as the terrestrial planets. There are places out there that are as different from Pluto as Venus is from Earth, or Mercury for that matter. There's some that have inert surfaces, there's some that have active surfaces, there's some that have a bunch of moons, some that have no moons, and some that are pink, and some that are blue. And you know, in every respect, it's a diverse population. And it deserves a survey, a suite of missions that go out there and look at these diverse planets of the Kuiper Belt. And so I think the big choice is between looking at the diversity or going back to Pluto and studying in depth. And I don't know how that's going to turn out in the decadal survey. There are forces marshalling on both sides. And uh, one or the other will end up getting the next mission of the Kuiper Belt. That's part of the adventure. Okay. Gordon asks if there's any way to know if other uh, planetary systems include Pluto-like objects, and right now our, our technology isn't capable of uh, detecting these, although we do have, uh, next month we're going to hear from Tabitha uh, Boyajian with uh, Tabby Star, and so she might have some insight onto that question, actually. You know, we think Pluto-like planets are common, uh, but we don't have actual evidence of that, except in our solar system, we know that they're the most populous class of planets, the, the dwarf planets of the Kuiper Belt. But we do know that Kuiper Belts are common. Even though we don't know what kinds of planets are in those Kuiper Belts, we can see them as dust disks on the outer fringes of other solar systems. And uh, they appear to be a very common construct. So there are going to be Kuiper Belts around uh, many, if not most, solar systems. Okay, I want to do a quick time check. We are at the top of the hour, and we promised that we'd be done by 7, but we have a lot of questions. Are you willing to hang in there for just a few more questions? And... For a few. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, William asks, um, if you had doubled the budget of the New Horizons mission, how much faster could you have gotten this done, and what would you have done to improve the mission? <laughs> well, that's easy. I think we wouldn't have done it any faster. If we had twice the money, we would have sent two spacecraft and we would have covered the far side of Pluto that Dave was talking about. It's so frustrating that we see in low resolution images, but we just weren't able to fly by up close. Uh, I'm sure that that's what we'd have done if we had twice the money. Uh, but we didn't have the money to afford what Voyager could afford, which was two spacecraft. And so we sent one and we rolled the dice and it, it turned out very well. It worked and uh, Pluto certainly performed scientifically. And uh, the combination uh, was a dream come true for all of us who worked on this project. A number of people are also asking if uh, the results of this mission are going to result in some sort of um, reevaluation of the status of Pluto as a planet or a dwarf planet, if there's going to be some voting at IAU about its status, uh, any, any potential changes? Well, we yeah, sure don't want astronomers trying to explain what are planets. We want planetary scientists to do that because we see what BS resulted when, they, uh, when the astronomers did it. Now, BS, I should clarify, is an acronym for bad science. They, David, yeah, you you're know, trying to get it. It's, it's funny because, uh, you know, I think neither Alan nor I is, is really advocating for the IAU to take another vote on this. Uh, you know, maybe they will at some point. Uh, it's clear that, that a lot of people recognize that their uh, definition is inadequate. I, I mean, for one thing, it doesn't even recognize the exoplanets. It talks about uh, a planet having to orbit the sun. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of problems with it. But what we notice is that planetary scientists are using uh, the word planet in a way that makes sense to us. When we go to meetings, 
people uh, refer to Pluto as a planet. They refer to Titan as a planet, uh, you know, because we're talking about the characteristics of these objects. And uh, we do comparative planetology and, you know, these objects have, we, we, talk, we compare mountains on, on Pluto and mountains on Titan and mountains on Earth. And, uh, you know, for planetary scientists, there's sort of a natural use of that, that word that is, uh, is the usage that's happening. And so a, a lot of the professionals in our field are, you know, they just kind of ignore the IAU ruling. You know, they, they're not the boss of us. You know, <laughs> and, you know, but also, the science doesn't work by voting. We don't take votes on anything in science. We don't vote on whether the periodic table is right. We don't take votes on the theory of relativity or human evolution or anything else. And voting is a, is a really bad practice for science. It, it gives the impression that things are arbitrary that, uh, uh, you know, by, uh, by ad campaign or something that you can sway a vote. It's not how science works. It works one scientist at a time, making up their minds until a consensus is reached. And what David's telling you is in planetary science, there is a consensus. The experts, the people who really do this for a living, not astronomers, but planetary scientists, call these bodies planets because that's what they are. And they voted with their feet and with their mouth and with their mind and uh, all of you out there are now deputized and authorized to call the dwarf planets planets just as planetary scientists do. All right. Well, we're going to go last question here. And I like this one. Uh, Gordon says, if we stood on Pluto on the side facing the sun, and I think that that would be a really fascinating you know, thing for any of us to do. If we were to stand on Pluto on the side facing the sun, how bright or dark would it appear compared to doing the same thing on Earth. Well, I'll take a crack at it. Um, we've actually calculated that, uh, you know, uh, and before we got New Horizons to Pluto as a public engagement activity, uh, we, uh, we did the calculation and then we put it out there and said, you know, it's about as bright as a nice clear day on Earth 20 minutes after sunset. So go outside 20 minutes after sunset and we'll call that Pluto time and take a picture. And it turns out thousands, even tens of thousands of people all around the world were taking pictures in the dusky twilight, um, showing scenes in Europe and in Africa and across North America. Uh, and, you know, you can read a book by that kind of light. And you can see your friends' faces and the colors of their clothes. It's a maddeningly dim light compared to what we're used to at high noon on the Earth. But it's enough light to see, to walk around, to explore the surface of Pluto. and uh, uh, you can go out now, even though we've done the flyby of Pluto, 20 minutes after sunset, that's Pluto time. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was actually really uh, surprised by that. And I mean, when you look at those pictures that people take at Pluto time, there, there's plenty of light. You know, it's partly because the human eye has such an amazing dynamic range. But the fact is, yeah, if you were on Pluto uh, at noon looking around, uh, you'd be able to see just fine. Wow. Well, I think that that would be an aspiration that uh, hopefully someday some humans will be out there and be able to have just that experience. So thank you very much, Dr. Stern and Grinspoon. This has been a most fascinating um, you know, talk, and I'm certainly looking forward to uh, reading the book. And, and I think that we've got uh, many of our members have read it, and they've indicated that they've really enjoyed that. And so thank you again for joining us from, uh, you know, Alan, anyway, from uh, somewhere on his travels. So thank you very much for taking time out to join us. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Thanks Dave. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Really enjoyed it.